inside. Um, five meters. <coughs> um, Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're uh, meeting here on Wurundjeri land and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Um, it is a, a sincere honour to be here with um, Georgina Q on the occasion of her exhibition pictures, a title I absolutely love, I have to say. Um, a, a, a project that's been um, developed um, very much for the context of uh, photo 2021. So, um, so we, I've, I've just worked out a few um, kind of conversation starters to um, for um, Georgina and I to kind of start thinking about, but really just focusing very much on, on Georgina's practice broadly and, and quite specifically about the um, exhibitions that are presented within pictures. Um, so we'll probably speak for about half an hour as a conversation and then we'll just open it up and actually if anyone has any kind of um, questions at any stage it'll be so informal as to um, um, encourage um, interjection as, as you so desire. Um, welcome Georgina. Thanks Mark. So this is, um, this is a show that is um, a, a long time coming. Uh, to give you a little bit of context about um, this space, so Gertrude Glass House is the project space of Gertrude Contemporary that opened in late 2015 and it is the um, principal space in which we present um, new solo exhibitions by artists involved in Gertrude's two-year studio program. So um, of the nine exhibitions that we would present a year, eight of those exhibitions are from artists um, presently in the um, in the studio program. A, a, a slight anomaly um, with, in this case with Georgina, so um, obviously this exhibition was going to take place um, in April of last year, um, <clears throat> but it's, um, uh, it's, I guess, a wonderful occasion to, um, to uh, present that again and to, um, to uh, stay committed to that partnership with Photo 2021. Um, so um, I, I invited George when I uh, had some initial conversations with um, Elias Redstone about Gertrude being a uh, participating venue within the program. You know, we thought it was a, a wonderful initiative for the city, a wonderful initiative to um, kind of celebrate and, and form connectivities between um, existing spaces and to really um, think about the ongoing importance and evolution of photography as a medium. And, and um, <clears throat> Georgina was in, in the program at that time and, and was one of, I guess, um, you know, as, as, a, as a program that supports artists working in all kinds of medium, um, Georgina was one of the, the few artists at that time that was working um, principally in photography. And I, I guess that's probably a really interesting place for um, for me to go into some questions that have sort of speak about um, this relationship to photography. So, um, and if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read some of these just because this is what I've, I've um, conveyed to Georgina, and and it would seem weird to go off topic. Uh, but your your works eventuate in photography, yet hold so many other forms of artistic uh, artistic production within them beginning with painting and sculpture and installation. Um, and for me, uh, the, the works have a, a lot of synergies with um, artists like Thomas DeMarc. Just wondering if you could talk about your processes and how photography functions as the conveyor of your work as a kind of an end point, I guess. Mm. Sure. Um, I might just say as a disclaimer, this is, as you said, this show was gonna be um, almost about nine months before it's on. So I'm in an unusual position where I made this work about a year ago and um, I sort of have to get back into the headspace of what I was thinking about when I was making it. It's kind of nice having that distance from it, um, but I've not been in a position where I've showed work that you know I made significantly um, before the show's actually on. Um, in terms of photography's role in my work, I kind of 
I mean, it's interesting to be part of a photography festival because I kind of consider photography an incidental part of my work. I, I don't particularly see myself as a photographer. Mm. Um, for the first kind of eight years of my practice, I was mostly working with sculpture and installation and textiles, kind of looking at similar um, uh, subject matter, kind of drawing a lot from noir film, a lot of forensic photography, um, kind of looking at um, cinematic effects of light and um, kind of how that translates in an image um, and sculpturally and kind of just incidentally as my work developed and kind of deviated from sculpture it um, well I mean as a side note I'll give you a bit of pretext which is that initially I kind of I got into this way of making work um, because I was actually making a film at the time um, and this was in 2016 um, where I I'd kind of felt a bit stylistically trapped because I was kind of stuck within this mode of working with textiles and I didn't really know where I wanted to take it. And I started just, um, it's quite pedestrian, but I, I started just um, making small performances in my parents' garage on an iPhone. Um, and I actually found that a really um, helpful tool to almost like how you take a Polaroid when you're doing a shoot or something like that. It was like kind of a way of making sketches um, and I found that really interesting and, and so from there I kind of scripted this film um, and I, I, the kind of premise of the film was based on Pygmalion and Galatea so it was sort of this, had this roots in Greek mythology and then I kind of dressed up as all these different femme fatale figures um, and had these sets kind of that I built based on looking at a lot of German expressionist film um, like Cameron Dr. Caligari and things like that. Um, and incidentally, I kind of decided to just take some photos of myself dressed in these characters in front of each of the sets. And that was just kind of an incidental byproduct, but I actually found them more interesting than the film. I felt the film was a bit literal and mm. kind of, I, I felt, felt that the stills were more intriguing and had more potential to kind of pursue further. So that, you know, I never set out to make photographs or anything like that. It just kind of ended up being um, one of the many iterations of these kind of sets and that's how I've decided to kind of show it in the gallery. But yeah, I think it's interesting. I, I find, people have asked before if I would like to show the sets themselves and I think the sets are less interesting. I think that once they're photographed, um, I personally find it really interesting seeing um, how all the materials become mediated once they're photographed, so they kind of become a bit more abstracted. Mm. And I like that ambiguity of, um, are you looking at a surface that's painted or is it printed? Um, and I also find photography a helpful tool because I've got so many kind of references jam-packed in there and a lot of different materials as well, and it kind of homogenises the scene. So I feel as if I can get away with doing a lot more, having this scene kind of... Um, you know, reduced down to this one material yeah. surface. I mean, I guess, um, you know, from some of the previous works that I, I would suggest relate to this body of work within which you've um, featured, they're in, in some kind of form uh, self-portraiture, but within a very, as you suggest, like an elaborate set, like a very um, Dadaoist, um, theatrical ensemble within a theatrical environment. And I think, you know, that idea of that, of your presence within those was really interesting. But I think this is why I think this body of work takes it in another direction. In, in your removal, it actually means that you can't necessarily focus on one particular thing. Like, I think mm. it's such a natural thing within photography to find the things that it kind of represents in a really photographic way. And I think this is what's so wonderful about this body of work. Also that really matte finish that you're not, in, in many ways, not really sure what it is you're, you're, you're looking at, whether it's a, it is indeed a painting or whether some of these um, kind of more fabric elements, which, in, 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 you know, when you look at them in some respects, they actually look like they're collaged, mm. collaged in. Yeah, and I think once you um, include a figure in it, um, it 
it kind of grounds it in a scale and a yeah. sort of reality. And I, I liked, I mean, in my last show, which was quite a while ago now, um, Neon Park in 2018, I had started to kind of experiment more with not including myself, but mm. still including um, sort of figurative elements, all these kind of abject references to the body in some of the sculptures and things like that, but kind of experimenting more with kind of colour and um, form and, um, and kind of being a bit more reductive in terms of what's actually in there, not having a figure in there. Because mm. it's not, I think it was, it was almost teetering towards becoming this serial, not Cindy Sherman, but you know, serial self-portraiture. Yeah. In, and I wanted to break that up a bit. Yeah. But I guess even in, in your removal from it, it also has this real, a, a, a quite a different um, atmosphere of composition and, and in that I would suggest it, it lends itself a bit more to kind of true painting in a way. Mm. Which isn't to say that photography doesn't do that, you know, compose its kind of structure, but yep. um, I think it sort of composes its structure with the idea of recording a kind of a moment or a place or a time. And I think painting in some ways operates in, in quite a different and a slower sensibility around composition. Yeah, and in terms of the kind of impression that it might be collage, I was thinking about this and I, I, I think that it could partly be to do with when they are photographed, typically what I'll do is I'll kind of, you know, experiment around a lot with props and things like that and I'll take hundreds and hundreds of photos on my iPhone. Um, just, you know, quite crappy low res images, but it kind of gives mm. me a sense of how it'll translate as a photograph. Um, and, and eventually I decide on one. Um, it's unfortunate timing. Um, that I kind of use as a blueprint, which I'll then kind of use as the guide of lighting and perspective and everything like that to then re-photograph high res. Mm. Um, but actually there's a lot of kind of issues that happen once you try it. So I'm trying to imitate this sort of tiny little image that I make on my iPhone in high res. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the impression that's a collage comes from, so like quite a lot of the images are actually literally a collage. It's probably about nine images stitched together. Some of the lighting has been grabbed from other photos. Oh right, so they actually are yeah, they, kind of composites. Yeah, they are right? not in a collage in the traditional sense. It's yeah. kind of, in Photoshop you can do a few tricks where it just takes information from one photo. Mm. So some of the lighting is actually, um, would be impossible to achieve with just one single shot. Yeah. Yeah. Which prob probably gives it a sense of unreality in, in certain aspects. Um, you know, there's, I mean, an example would be that, say, this photograph, one of the background that was taken with the, the mid-ground was very dark where it recessed, recessed at the corner and mm. I wanted to bring that forward. I mean, these are just really basic formal things, but I wanted to bring that forward because I, I wanted it to have a flatness to it, yeah. like that tension between having a very flat background has this weird kind of floral rep repetitive print and then the foreground kind of becomes more and more textured. Mm. So I think maybe that's kind of what gives the impression that, because it kind of is a collage really. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, um, you know, and that's something I've been thinking about quite a lot in relation to the, the broad theme of, of photo 2021 being truth and about um, questioning and, and, and proposing, you know, the medium of photography's relationship to, um, you know, the recording in some ways the determination of, of truth in, in so far as it's something that records something that um, largely happens. And I think your works complicate that relationship to truth quite, um, quite um, interestingly in, in so far as they, they do record something, they record a kind of a, um, a set, but they're kind of ambiguous in their um, place, they're ambiguous in their um, time, they're kind of ambiguous even in terms of the medium of it even being photography. So given your kind of interest in, in, um, in you know, I guess more kind of surreal and Dadaist and, and futurist um, movements, like what, for you, what is your work's relationship to, to truth? Um, it's hard. I mean, I, I kind of want to talk about, you know, the idea of photographs, I think, have so much less currency in terms of documenting reality now. Like, mm. you know, you've got deep fakes and things like that. I don't know if that conversation necessarily applies to my work specifically. Um, 
but I do think, I think that probably in terms of the truth, it's definitely um, just related to the simple kind of formal and material ambiguity of what the image is. Mm. And I really like to keep, try and retain that in um, kind of just basically the colours I use, what, what the person thinks they're looking at when they're immediately looking at the image, mm. that kind of ambiguity of um, what the scale is, whether it is a painting or whether it's a photograph. Um, and I kind of edit them in a way to keep it within that ambiguous space. So like yeah. removing certain, um, I guess like clues that would really give away the scale or um, what the material is, mm. um, whether it's glossy. I think going, often I'll kind of, I mean the black and white image, um, I definitely, um, use a trick of Jean Cocteau, which was to just create this very dark background that I'd increase um, in post when I edit it, just so that it kind of has this impression of like this white pattern sort of floating in space. Mm. Um, and so you're not quite sure what, what's actually the surface that's, that the white has been painted on. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but yeah. I think, I think really it's kind of sustaining that ambiguity of um, I think it's using photography to kind of make the other materials more ambiguous and yeah. vice versa. What about your practices relation to time? Like, you know, a lot of the, the references you speak of, uh, speak of a, you know, modernist and historical, um, you know, artistical, cultural movements, which I think, again, is, is quite an interesting thing to um, not so much be re revisionist, but be um, so influenced by historical movements, which I think in some ways kind of confuses the, um, you know, I guess the contemporaneity of mm. your work. I mean, I do hope that, um, just as a side note, you know, there are some photos that I, um, I do hope kind of are contemporised a bit by, you know, like having a Nike sneaker yeah. in there. I, I think that's less the case in this body of work, but there is, I mean, you know, there's iron lac, um, and bunning foxes that you can kind of mm. see there. So, and you know, there's, you know, you can kind of see even like the the button of my parents' garage kind of hanging down. Mm. So I think if you look closely, you can kind of see a few cracks there. Um, uh, but, sorry, I've lost track of what your question actually was. I just deviated. Oh, I, I'm, I read one of these questions and then I've just deviated. Oh, so, okay, so. okay. No um, but I mean, That's I think good. this, this idea funny. of the this idea of the parent's garage, I think, is also really interesting. Like when I talk about this idea of, um, you know, historical reference points, it's in, in, in many ways and in, in quite obvious ways, it's not a, a, um, a, um, a kind of an emulation of these movements. In some ways, it's a kind of a reproposition of them within this, within this kind of the context of um, you know not necessarily Australia but the here and the now and it's kind yeah. of in some ways it's looking at at um, this kind of um, in some ways very lo-fi um, um, kind of restaging of these historical moments but yep. within and this is what I love about the garage this kind of contemporary suburban Australian environment. I almost think of it as like a seedy teenager's bedroom or something like just working in my parents garage on 33 it kind of but actually that space in itself um like I was saying you know at the, at the start of making this body of work because I feel I, I kind of associate this body of work with the pro overall project I've been working on for about five years yeah. um, which started with the video mm -hmm. and and actually um I actually found it really helpful you know feeling kind of stylistically entrapped in a sense you know, the studio became a space of like what I think I should be making. And then I just kind of used my parents' garage and I was like, oh no, that's not really my work. And that actually gave me a freedom to then work with other materials or mediums and like performance. I never thought I'd do anything like that. Mm. Um, which was interesting. It was just the associations of the studio and then moving to the garage. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, you asked before kind of what my relationship is with the kind of historical material that I use. Mm. I definitely think that, I mean, what gets me excited in the studio is this idea of having a working relationship with history. Yeah. And there's really specific kind of interest there. Um, and a lot of it is kind of early 20th century film. Um, 
you know, a lot of Dada constructivists, like really very strong stylistic movements, mm. which I can kind of, and I think that in a way using them, it become, because they're so iconic, I think it becomes, um, uh, you know, when I adopt them and kind of change them, it becomes quite noticeable because people know, I mean, even yeah. if, even if you don't, haven't seen Cabin of Dr. Caligari, I feel as if almost everybody can universally recognise German Expressionist yeah. film and that kind of really strong black and white kind of style of painting those sets. Mm. Um, but also, you know, I, I don't really talk about this directly with my work, but one of my favourite works um, is Duchamp's Etant Donnée. Do you know that one? The Illuminating Gas, which was, it was the last work that he made. He told everybody that he quit art. Um, and then secretly made this work in his garage for 20 years. And then, As in the glass. Yeah, no. it's, it's sort of a, um, it's a reference to Courbet's um, yeah. painting and it's a woman kind of lying back in the grass naked and it's kind of this trompe l'oeil, you look through a peephole and it's this tableau that he made. Mm. Um, and he kind of made it in secret in his garage and then died and just donated it to the Philadelphia Museum of Art and left these instructions. I actually bought his instruction book it's all in French, but it's really interesting. Mm. Um, but I, I love that idea of just using what you've got in a garage yeah. space. Yeah. And like, I mean, obviously I go and buy materials, but I kind of, I'm a big fan of kind of the, what, what you can actually make once you impose restrictions on yourself. Yeah. And, and I kind of borrowed that sort of loosely, that, that concept from Duchamp, I think. Yeah. I mean, I guess even like in theatre uses that all the time, the idea of these kind of props that, that can, are easily, you know, they're flat for all intents and purposes, but to kind of offer that sense of kind of three-dimensionality. Yeah, yeah. And also, like, if, when you read into kind of German Expressionist film, it was really, um, they were really resourceful because they had so, I mean, in terms of like the... Um, resolution cameras were so poor and they had such small budgets that, you know, they, I mean, Cabin of Dr. Caligari, they physically hand painted the light, lighting on the sets because they couldn't afford proper lighting. Mm. And then that became a style in itself yeah. accidentally. And I kind of love that idea that, that when you have limited resources, you can kind of make more interesting stuff. Yeah. So this, this, you mentioned it just before this ongoing five year project. Mm. What, what, what is this project? My parents' garage, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of these works, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of these works I did make at Gertrude. Yeah. And then I, I actually moved them to my parents' garage. I was, gonna, I was gonna shoot them at Gertrude and then I just felt I couldn't do it. I had to do it in the garage because I was so familiar with the lighting and everything yeah. like that. And I, I so, you know, I kind of moved them all there. Um, yeah, I do. I feel like there's an attachment to that space in particular. Yeah. I mean, all the sets I made there or shot there and yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, like it is a project, but then also when I go back and look at my earlier work, there's certainly kind of a thread there mm. of 20th century film, lighting, looking at all of those references um, uh, and, and kind of creating um, this kind of illusionistic space, but then also at times breaking that and revealing yeah. the mechanics of that as well, so, yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, for me, that's why the work kind of keeps coming back to Thomas Tamar, which is, you know, a, a far more rigid form of that kind of operation, but, um, you know, going through these elaborate processes of replication and installation for, to take an image of this work and then for all of that um, construction to, kind of be, and, and there's, there have been many people that have tried to encourage him to make kind of three-dimensional environments and he, he, he always oh, says he'll really? never do it. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, That's interesting. likes the kind of the capacity of, of photography to kind of hold that illusion in some ways, but also I guess reveal that illusion as illusion. Mm. I feel, I kind of have this, I, I mean, I don't know if you saw the NGV show of Jeff Wall and Thomas Demand. Mm. Um, and I remember when I was younger, I loved Thomas Demand, and I still do, but his work's very diagrammatic. Yeah. And I feel like there's a relationship to history that's a little bit one dimensional, whereas mm. Jeff Wall, I think, has a really sophisticated relationship. And it, it was funny seeing those two artists together because I almost feel like. There's, a, um, there's something that I kind of admire more in Jeff Wall than in Thomas Demand, I think. Mm. And in terms of, I mean, this is deviating, but when you're talking about 
the idea that, you know, photographs are often, um, you know, they document kind of a moment in time mm. and that mine are far more constructed. Um, I thought back to Jeff Hall's A Sudden Gust of Wind, um, you yeah. know, the Hokusai one. Um, and, you know, it's kind of this, I don't know if anyone's seen it or is familiar with it, but it's, it's um, kind of a contemporary version of Hokusai's work and it's just uh, like a gust of wind blowing all this paper and everything but he actually photographs that over nine months like it looks very spontaneous but it's actually a collage of many photographs together mm. it's like really meticulously staged mm. um, which I just thought was quite interesting as a process I mean they're you know those two are the only kind of contemporary ish references that you've made are there are there other artists that, whose work you look at like operating now, and, this, and they may also be artists that um, similarly have a, a, an interest in the reanalysis of history. Um, not in the reanalysis of history, but I, I should mention John Devola because I'm a big fan. I mean, it's not really contemporary, mm. but his Zuma series that he made in the 80s um, definitely inspired me a lot. Mm. That's probably more in relation to this idea of kind of um, in, like having this process that incorporates sculpture, a little bit of performance and a little bit of photography, but it's not quite categorically any of those things. Mm. And I, I really, um, yeah, I'm a big fan of his work. Mm. Um, in terms of contemporary artists who work with history, I mean, I think that, you know, artists like, even just Melbourne artists like Sharon Goodwin, I really yeah. admire her work, or Zilvesta. Um, and... Um, I mean, there's a lot. Which again, is sort of, you know, when I look at their works, again, they're sort of resistant around time, I would say. Mm, yeah, I agree, definitely. And I, I quite admire that, I think. Which also means resistant to trend, which I also quite like, you know, not to, to a fashion of a moment. Yeah, exactly. And I really admire that in Sharon's work, that she's kind of persisted with this style that I think really works. It's not repetitive. Mm. It, it kind of, like, it still um, evolves and changes. Um, but I really admire that she's kind of resistant to those, um, those trends in a way, mm. yeah. Uh, there's a lot of other artists, but I can't remember them now, of course. <laughs> no, there's many other artists. <laughs> just, just trust me. Um, maybe we'll open it up to, um, to you guys, if there's anything that you wanted Georgina to explore around her work or... I will say Mary Reed Kelly. Sorry, I'm just totally interrupting, but she could yeah. say that everyone that she thinks of, she's gonna say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll just I'll just yeah. Well this Interject. was a question that I was wondering. Like this and this comes down to um, like an audience for art. Um, you know, if you could have your work in front of I, I mean, I guess we're all slowly getting used to this idea of being present with work and um, you know, I've been thinking this a little bit about this a little bit over the last couple of weeks and of course uh, throughout last year this um, this kind of sense of this um, you know and you mentioned it before the kind of the mediation of, of the image but um, you know the, 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 the fact that we've been kind of experientially um, you know in Melbourne um, prohibited from seeing works in person and you know I think that's such an important thing that photography could do in terms of its um, you know I guess it's portability of conveyance um, but you know there's something so important about being kind of um, you know I guess in some ways slowing down and being in the presence of a work even if it's image based um, mm -hmm. so would, if you could have five people in this room right now looking at your work and this is about audiences <laughs> this is about sort of people that you think are of um, you're interested in that you would like to have them see what you do, who would they be? I mean, it would probably be the artists who are referenced in, um, in my work in this show in particular. Mm. So Jean Cocteau, um, Picasso, um, Francis Picabia, Matisse. Um, I might put the Queen in there just because I'd like to meet her. Oh, that's her. wonderful. Yeah. yeah. I think she'd be really polite as well. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. So we might open it up if anyone's got any questions. Yvette? Hi. Hi. Um, when I look at your work, I think about the process involved and I imagine your work painting. I don't have to mention you painting directly. So I was just wondering when you're trying to make choices in, about your work, I'm sure you're very Um. Do 
you mean in terms of like, you know, I've got, um, say, there's a, um, a face based on an Oscar Schlemmer costume, that was a terrible pronunciation, um, on a vase on the right. Do you mean in terms of like what, what led that decision to include that there? I think it really is trial and error. I mean, I'm definitely drawn to certain, um, I mean, for example, that screen was based on a um, Picasso still life. And I thought that um, the way it's kind of, well, I really liked the, I mean, something as simple as the colors that were used, I thought were really interesting. Um, I thought that I could kind of use all of those, like I could create kind of a composition that's very warm in the tones that I use. Um, I really liked how, um, that painting had this kind of ambiguity in itself in terms of like the flatness of the planes and um, but then also there's like figurative elements that I thought would um, be quite interesting if, to use in a photograph and then it really is trial and error I mean I think that it probably is personal taste partly I just I something I'm drawn to and then I'll play around with it and see how it kind of um, works with the rest of the composition and things like that so yeah and the painting, yeah, it is interesting. I'm a big fan of painting. Um, I'm not a very good painter in the traditional sense, but I use a lot of spray paint and um, a lot of drawing as well. And um, I have a, I do think that I have a, I have a big respect for a lot of kind of European painting and friends that are painters and stuff like that. So I think that kind of infuses into the work as well. Yeah, I like that, definitely. And I do look at um, even just situationist graffiti in France, like in the 70s, and just a lot of subway graffiti in New York in the 80s and stuff like that, I think. Even Keith Haring, I kind of really like that. Um, that really graphic style, I really like. And I actually, just as a material, like I find spray paint, I, I tend to gravitate towards materials where there's like a lot of, a lot of resistance, mm. and I find it's... It's not just for the challenge, it's also um, because I actually find that usually what I set out to do is way less interesting than what, what kind of accidentally happened, like say mm. taking photographs instead of making a film. And I think the spray paint is like, you just have to embrace a lot of the incidental accidents that happen with it and the resistance I find really interesting. Mm. I mean, I guess it's also got this, um you know, you reflecting that you're not a very good painter, but you know, I think there's different kinds of forms of painting that, you know, require so much discipline. And in some ways, you know, this actually starts to head back into this Thomas Demann territory where there's a kind of a plan and then there's a kind of a slow and methodical execution of that plan that, that can't incorporate any shifts or changes. Yes. And I think when I say I'm not a very good painter, I, I think like many people just get overwhelmed by um, the um, kind of infinite possibilities. Yeah. And I work very well with limitations. Yeah. And so working, working with you know, spray paint and then photography and sculpture is kind of is a way of imposing these restrictions where all, it, it just gives more opportunity for like nice accidents to happen, mm. I think. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Do you want to unpack that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> One day. <laughs> um, you mentioned resistance of materials, and they're quite like messy, and there's a lot going on in the images, but also well composed and kind of polished to the extent that it's possible. Do you ever try to push the images as far as like? I think that, um, I mean, I'm a perfectionist, I think like a lot of people, um, to my detriment. And I think that, that if I have full control over materials, yep. um, it, it's, it just ends up a bit flat, I think. And 
but also, unfortunately, I've learned that you can't engineer mistakes. Like you can't kind of engineer those because yeah. it just looks staged. It doesn't mm. work. So I think that, I mean, most of my work is just me trying to circumvent my perfectionism and like put put. Um, so perfectionism wins at the end anyway. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, it's still it's still always there, but I guess. Um, I mean, I definitely wouldn't consider that image perfect in any way. Um, and I think that um, if I had full control over all the materials that I use, I think the image would look very different and probably far less interesting. What about that relationship to, um, you know, it's an, it's an odd one, but what about your work's relationship to beauty? Like this idea of, you know, you suggest that you're happy to embrace um, you know, the accidents as they happen. But, you know, in the end, what we see is, are these really striking, dare I say, beautiful images. Like, what is, um, what, what do you think your work's relationship is to, to beauty? I don't really think about um, artworks in terms of um, beauty. Mm. I don't, I think I, d I don't even, I mean, I don't really have a personal definition for that. Mm. Um, I think I just, I just look at, or I interpret an image, at least my own images, I'll kind of workshop which images I think work based on their impact, I mm -hmm, think, mm -hmm. or um, uh, there sort of needs to be a level of like it needs to be cohesive in itself. And I think that, um, I don't know, I'm being very ambiguous here, but I think- Oh, it's mysterious though. <laughs> I mean, what do you mean by beauty? What's your- Well, like, to, um, you know, I guess, uh, uh, you know, if we don't think about beauty, but if we think about, um, you know, aesthetics, mm. you know, if we think about something, um, you know, or we think about, um, you know, seduction or allure, you know, we could change the words endlessly but a, a kind of when you feel like you get to a point where it is um, you said impactful or impact I think having I mean I kind of liked the work to operate on a few different levels and like the first would be having a point of accessibility for um, people for viewers um, that are artists but also ones that aren't versed in art history mm. and like you can I feel as if they're kind of tools you can use. To me, photograph fabric is always a winner. Yeah. Um, but they're just kind of like points of access, like yeah. form, colour, things like that. And then beyond that, there's kind of another level of interpretation I like a work to have, or like, that I want it to have, which is it kind of has this conversation with art historical moments and other moments that um, are recognisable, not in terms of being like this, um, prescriptive code that you need to crack but just it kind of engages with history and you know there's like you could even do that with abstract painting mm. like it has a it's self-aware of the, yeah. what's come before it yeah and I think that's to me actually that's probably what makes the work really beautiful that mm. it has this um, like there's there's different modes of interpretation one gives immediate access the other one has a kind of longer more patient mm. um, engagement with history yeah. and yeah and then also I mean sorry to sound romantic but I, I also kind of think that at its core an artwork should just be kind of like wrapped in this mystery which I think is why Etant Donnet is my favourite work by mm. Duchamp because it's just so bizarre that mm. it's like the least Duchamp work that he ever made and it's just like veiled by it has all of those 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 levels of interpretation but at its core it's just a total mystery of what he did. Mm. I think this show in particular made me, I, I haven't used this process before where, um, this is the first time I've not um, had a photo, displayed a photograph behind glass or perspex and um, personally I've noticed that I have an appreciation for um, just showing the raw paper and how different that actually looks in real life than on the screen mm. because similar to when you put gla glass in front of a photo, 
and when you look at it on a screen, it has this like glossiness to it and it becomes um, far more identifiable as a photograph. And so I think I kind of have an appreciation for that, that raw paper component. I mean, that's just kind of a material thing. But, yeah. but I think, you know, that's also, we spoke a bit about that when we were installing, you know, that have not having that, um, um, not having the image mediated in a way, like yeah, you know, yeah. kind of, which is and ironic. This, I, and this, about, this yeah. is also, a, you know, I think the suggestion of being able to see works in person, having that experience of of scale and atmosphere, but also being able to kind of be pulled in or, or seduced into an image, you know, especially something with such kind of um, you know luscious and um, you know deep coloration. I think. The idea of the framed image or having something that in some ways is reflective in some ways and in some ways that we can always see ourselves would be, um, would really change the kind of the ambience of these works. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's, um, I almost feel as if it's definitely underused in photography, probably not so much in art, but just in general. Like you, you encounter photographs so much on the screen or even in a magazine, like that glossiness mm. really roots it in photography and I yep. think that there's kind of another side to photography that has this really nice light, just the coloration and the matteness of the surface mm. is really beautiful. Hi. Oh, it's a combination. I think that that for that image, I I did purchase the um, the mannequin head um, actually at the <laughs> Dean's Art next to Gertrude. I was eyeing it for a while, um, but everything else I pretty much made. There's sort of a lot of um, paper mache. There's um, again a head for, based on an Oscar Schlemmer. God, I'm really saying his name terribly. Oscar Schlemmer costume. Um, and then the, most of the um, ceramics I just buy secondhand and then I paint them as well. So yeah, it's kind of a combination. Uh, well, if anyone's got any um, further questions, Georgina will probably be here for the next 15 minutes. Um, but I would like to thank you all so much for coming and to um, really encourage you to get um, involved in and invested in the um, Photo 2021 program. I know that there's a big kind of open day around the um, Fitzroy Collingwood area this afternoon. And so if anyone needs um, uh, some further information on Georgina's work, there's a room sheet available and there's also the program for Photo 2021. But um, thank you so much, Georgina. And I'd like to... <laughs> Thank you so much for your generosity. Oh, thanks and so thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you for yeah. coming.